welcome to the museum. Uh, I'm Sarah Bloomfield, its director, and delighted to have you with us tonight. And to have, uh, we're being streamed on live, so we wanna um, welcome our digital audience. Um, we have some special guests with us from the Moroccan and Polish Embassy. And we're delighted that we also have um, with us tonight Holocaust survivors who are always the most special guests at this institution, as you can understand. Uh, for those of us joining uh, online who want to participate in the Q&A section, um, please use the hashtag AskWhy. I just wanted to give uh, a few reflections before I turn it over to my colleague Edna Friedberg. Um, I think many of you may know that the museum's about to be 25 years old next April, very exciting for us. And as I reflect on this milestone, I've thought often about how the institution has grown and changed over the years, and that in its very short history, there's been a few individuals who've had a great impact on our work. One was our former DC police chief, Charles Ramsey, who visited this museum, and that visit led to his insight that we should create a training program for all law enforcement officers. And now we train police chiefs and FBI agents and members of the judiciary, judiciary and military. And another person who helped transform this institution is here tonight. And I wanna just tell you how that happened. Um, as you can imagine, I get lots of books sent to me. Any new book on the Holocaust lands on my desk. And fortunately, most of them, I can't pay too much attention to. There's so many. I guess that's good news. But over a decade ago, one of them really caught my eye. And I noticed the subtitle, which said, I don't know if you can read it, Law Stories from the Holocaust Long Reach into Arab Lands. Trust me, I never had a book on a topic like that. And I was not familiar at the time with its author, but I read the book and I immediately reached out to Rob Satloff. And this book and his vision, as we talked about the potential there, turned out to be an opening for the museum to address this little understood aspect of Holocaust history and reach important new audiences. Meeting Rob led to a trip we took together to Morocco, where we concluded the first agreement between a Holocaust institution and an Arab government when we were granted access to copy all the wartime records of the Moroccan National Library. And that was the beginning of a very systematic effort on the part of the museum to collect documentation on the Holocaust in North Africa. At the time, Rob and I also visited the Tunisian National Archives, and many years later, just now, that first initial meeting is finally starting to bear fruit. Today, our collection includes 80 oral histories with North African survivors, dozens of photographs of Jewish life in North Africa, and over half a million pages of documentation on the topic. And our Mandel Center has sponsored research on this little known part of Holocaust history. But there's still much to be discovered and many more stories to be told, and that leads to the wonderful program we have with us tonight. So it's a great pleasure to turn the program over to my colleague, Edna Friedberg, uh, one of our historians who will moderate uh, our program. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, welcome to all of you. Um, my name is Edna Friedberg, as Sarah said earlier, a historian here at the museum, and I am delighted uh, this evening to share the stage with two um, fascinating scholars who you will have the pleasure of hearing from this evening. We often talk about our world today as being extraordinarily interconnected, that it's smaller than ever before. Uh, but in fact, this is not a new phenomenon. Technology allows communication to happen with much greater speed. But I think what we will find tonight is that events that happen in seemingly disparate, far-flung places have long reverberations that change the course of other events. And that is part of why we will, be, we will be discussing why North Africa this evening, to understand those interconnected threads. Because, in fact, it is impossible to talk about the history of the Holocaust without fully understanding the history of World War II as a backdrop. 
It is impossible to talk about the history of World War II in Europe without understanding that governments and military commanders were considering uh, strategies and implications in other parts of the world as well. So that's the backdrop against which I hope that we can have this discussion today. We are here this evening in particular to focus on a lesser known uh, invasion of World War II, Operation Torch. And in just a few weeks on November 8th, we will mark the 75th anniversary of this, uh, the first allied offensive in the European theater. I am joined today by Dr. Meredith Hindley, uh, who is a historian and author of a new book, Destination Casablanca, Exile, Espionage, and the Battle for North Africa in World War II. And let me tell you, if you've not seen this book yet, I highly recommend that you pick it up. Don't take my word for it. The Wall Street Journal just gave it a glowing review, calling it authoritative and entertaining. Uh, and it will be for sale after the program. So welcome, Meredith. Thank you. Uh, to my left is Dr. Robert Satloff. Uh, Rob is the executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and author of another wonderful book, as you just heard, Among the Righteous, Lost Stories from the Holocaust's Long Reach into Arab Lands, which was also uh, turned into a PBS documentary for which Rob served as producer, if I'm not mistaken, right? And star. And star, yes. <laughs> Modest star, so. <laughs> Uh, Meredith, let's begin with you. With why North Africa? Can you tell us how you came to work in this field, how this story came across your desk? What was the background for you? Well, like everybody else, I saw the movie Casablanca. Um, I first saw it in high school, and I was enchanted by the story. I was more interested, though, in the question of why the French resistance was in North Africa, why are there refugees there? Even then, I could say I had a historian brain already going. Um, and then when I was in graduate school doing work on another project about, that, had a, that was related to the Holocaust and to relief during World War II, when I was in the archives spinning microfilm, I would see references to telegrams and reports talking about internment camps and refugees and visas with the, you know, or originating from Casablanca or about Casablanca. And of course my brain started going. And I was thinking, huh, I wonder what's actually going on there. Um, but at the time, you know, it's one of those shiny things when you're doing research that you can't really um, follow up on, but I tucked it away. And so, over the next few years, over like the next decade or so, every time I would see the movie again, I would remember those documents. And my brain would start going again. And um, so when I was looking for a book project, I thought, you know, I should really dig in and see what was going on in Casablanca and what really was happening and what the story was there. And Rob, I'd like to ask you a similar question. Obviously, you have experience working in the uh, history of this region. Uh, you're currently at work on a new project focusing on Algeria. What was it that drew you to your current story, and what is it at this moment in time that you think makes it germane? Thank you, Edna. Um, I am right now working on uh, a story that I first uh, came across 15, 18 years ago in the original research for uh, for the book Among the Righteous. And it began with the story of the Jewish resistance in Algiers. Um, perhaps, I call it the, the most consequential um, resistance movement of the war. Because um, unlike all the other really important, profound, powerful resistance movements, this one actually changed the course of the war. Because it helped the Americans enter Algiers. Um, and it's the only resistance movement that saved American lives. So I thought this resistance movement needed to be, um, we needed to learn more about it. And so I, I first wrote a page about this 15 years ago, and I put it away saying this, this page deserves a lot more. And so I came back to it a couple of years ago here um, when I was uh, fortunate to spend time at the museum. And that led me on a path really to look more at not just the resistance movement, but at American policy because uh, we're gonna to talk tonight about the first time Americans came in any, um, in any substance, in any shape, in any numbers, first time they came to the Middle East in um, 100, almost 150 years. 
Not since the, the Barbary pirates and, you know, uh, from the shores of Tripoli did Americans come to the Middle East like they did in 1942. And uh, um, people really don't know that story. And so I thought that would be worthy of telling. And so that's what brought me to, uh, to the research I've been doing recently. Okay, so with the full knowledge that you're teasing us a little about this consequential resistance movement, which I promise we will get to in a few moments, let's set the scene, though. What are we talking about? Because, in fact, even the title of our program is with, painted with a very broad brushstroke. North Africa is not one uniform place. Um, Rob, could you set, shed some insight on the countries we're talking about, the policies, the colonial legacies that are setting the stage for 1940s. Sure, I think it's, it, let, let, let's remember the scene for a minute here. We're talking about uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, um, and Libya. You can you see the map. Operation Torch is just focused on Morocco and Algeria. Um, now, Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria were all French-controlled areas. Um, two of them were protectorates, Morocco and Tunisia. They had their own monarch, um, uh, the, the, the Sultan of Tunisia, the Bey, I'm sorry, the, the Sultan of Morocco, the Bey of Tunisia. Algeria was special. Algeria was actually a piece of France. You were um, as much a French citizen if you were a European born in um, Algiers as if you were born in Paris or Marseille. So it was a part of France. Now, in, uh, 19, um, uh, in 1940, uh, France suffered its horrendous defeat at the hands of the Germans. Um, I think we all know the, 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 the broad outlines of the story, um, uh, the French defeat. Uh, weeks later, um, uh, the, the, the Vichy government um, uh, is established under uh, Marshal Pétain. And in these French territories that the French controlled, Vichy was the governing power. Um, uh, so that's the, that's the basic um, context um, for a profound decision that the Allies had to take, which is where do they attack first in the European theater of war? Um, there were some who argued that they should go directly attacking Europe, France. Um, this is, of course, you know, where the Germans were, sort of like Willie Sutton and the Banks. Where do you go? You go where the money is. Well, some of the American generals wanted to just attack directly against where the Germans were. But Winston Churchill argued against this. He thought that they weren't ready and that if they suffered another defeat the way the um, French suffered in June 1940, it might mean the end of democratic life in Britain and the Germans may, may take over. So he convinced FDR to take the long route around and instead um, uh, begin the first offensive battle in the European theater, not in Europe at all, but to do it in the French territories in North Africa. So knowing that and that military and uh, political calculation, Meredith, could you tell us a little more about what's happening on the ground? What is the social composition there? And what were these camps that you were seeing tantalizing tidbits about while doing your research? Sure. Um, so Algeria is a country of about, at this point, 7.5 million people. There are approximately 140,000 Jews. Uh, Morocco is about 6 million, and it has a population of about 240 thousand Jews. So the advent of Vichy means that Jewish policies, the anti-Jewish policies are being implemented. And they're implemented in more, in a more um, uh, onerous and punitive way in Algeria than they are in Morocco. As for the stratum, the other thing you have to keep in mind about um, French Morocco and Algeria is that the Europeans are at the top. They're the top of the pecking order. Then come the Arabs and then come the Jews. So the Jews were already third class citizens and that meant that um, Vichy, policies, Vichy policies that came in would only exacerbate that. I think one thing that comes to mind when you're talking about it is it's often uh, tempting or simpler to think of the Holocaust as sort of a black hole 
which was uniformly and anti-Jewish policies applied uniformly across Europe, when in fact that was certainly not the case. It's not only because it is Vichy rather than Nazis implementing it, but even in Nazi-controlled direct territory, the fate of Jews varied widely. So j just to add to what Meredith said, and um, I think Meredith gave exactly what happened in, in, these, in this area, um, Algeria has a, has a unique experience in that um, uh, uh, while, of course, the, the same extent of persecution was, no, was nowhere like what happened in Europe, but what happened in Algeria was it was the only people outside of Germany and Austria, the only Jews who lost their citizenship, who were stripped of their citizenship as Frenchmen. And so um, it, was, it was a unique punishment that Algerians suffered. They were stateless, totally stateless. They had no citizenship um, because of the imposition of Vichy laws. And uh, um, as, as you added, Edna, earlier, um, uh, one of the things that Vichy had done that uh, Meredith uh, mentioned uh, a moment ago is, is establishing camps, concentration camps, they called them punishment camps, torture camps, slave labor camps, um, all throughout this arena, um, especially in the Sahara, but not only, sometimes very close to major urban areas. We have a picture here of a, a labor camp. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about this camp or other camps like it? What were conditions like there? Um, sure. So the um, both Alger in both Algeria and French Morocco, labor camps and internment camps were established by the um, French authorities to house undesirables. And undesirables could be. Jews, they could be in Morocco, they could be Spanish Moroccans who they or Spanish Republicans who they were worried might cause political trouble. It was often also refugees who found their way to Morocco or Algeria who ran out of money, who were also German, Polish, Russian, Czech, um, not French. And so Imfut, the, which we're seeing pictures of here right now, was a particularly brutal label, labor camp in Morocco. And in some of the work camps, they used, it was essentially slave labor. They used them to mine, they used them to build the Trans-Saharan Railroad. Um, it was a horrible existence um, on the edge of the Saharan Desert. Brutal temperatures, incredibly hot at night, incredibly cold during the day, meager rations. Um, it was a really sad existence for the men who found themselves there. And what scale are we talking about? Approximately how many people were imprisoned in these camps? Uh, probably a total of about 14,000. So let's get to Operation Torch then, which is the anniversary, the reason we were here. Rob, what, if anything, did the American government know about the existence of such camps, about treatment of Jews? Did it in any way play into any of their thinking or plans? The first part of your question is they knew a lot. The, second, uh, the answer to the second part of the question is that it, it factored almost nothing into their plans. Um, uh, I mean, American officials certainly had reports, diplomatic reports, um, reports from um, escapees, um, uh, that uh, made their way um, uh, out of the camps. Um, certainly they knew what was going on. Um, but this is not what motivated the invasion of North Africa. Um, uh, and matter of fact, it's a bit of an afterthought um, even how to address what to do with the people in the camps or what to do with the, you know, the, the Jews who were suffering uh, from various um, Vichy-type persecutions. You know, the, the main predominant motivation for the decision to attack North Africa was A, the urgency of attacking somewhere, and B, um, uh, uh, the, the, the idea that, well, two ideas. One, that if you could do North Africa and move your way across North Africa and spring your way to Italy, you could open up a, a totally new front through what Churchill called the soft underbelly of Europe. And then there was always this intrigue about turning the French. You know, the French in, under Vichy, they weren't enemies. They weren't allies. We had relations with the French under Vichy. We maintained diplomatic relations with Vichy. And there was this idea that, well, maybe, just maybe, we could turn the French from being collaborators with the Germans 
to possibly partnering with us. And so all these thoughts came together with the idea of, of, of focusing on North Africa. So it was strategically feasible, but it was also a gamble about the politics. It was certainly a gamble about the politics. And in some sense, some of the presumptions were wrong. You know, the idea was that, that, the, that the French weren't going to shoot back. And Roosevelt invested a lot of effort in, in diplomacy and trying to, to have Americans in North Africa convince French commanders that when we do come, don't shoot. Um, and it didn't quite work out that way. I'd like to build a little bit on what um, Rob said, which is that in 1942, the Allies needed a second front because uh, Stalin and the Eastern Front was getting chewed up. He was desperate for, the Brit for Britain and the United States to take some pressure off of him. There were very few options available in European theater for the Americans and the British in 1942. It was simply, there just weren't enough men, material, and ships in order to do a cross-channel invasion at that time. It was not going to be feasible until the beginning of 1943 maybe spring of 1943, but they needed to get men into the European theater, um, both to take pressure off Stalin, but also domestically for Roosevelt for purposes because Pearl Harbor, had, it, Pearl Harbor was in December 1941. The sooner um, they decided on a year first policy, and that meant that they needed to get American men into the European theater and have the American people invested in the fight. And the sooner they could do that, the better it would be for the war effort domestically. And North Africa seemed like a, uh, a viable option. Also, by taking North Africa, you would create a logistical network for the Allied war effort, which meant that you could take Casablanca and Algiers. Casablanca is the largest port in Africa on the Atlantic. If you take Casablanca, then you can turn it into a logistical hub. If you also take Morocco, you also get the airfield at Port Laute, which is the only concrete airstrip in all of North Africa, which means you can land heavy bombers and resupply troops. So essentially, Casablanca becomes a hub. You can move men and material up to Algiers, and from Algiers and Oran across the Mediterranean to Italy, to Greece, and to southern France. And that's exactly what they did. So if we could go back a slide, please, to the previous map. Um, Rob, if you don't mind just walking us through very briefly what exactly happened in this operation. Where did they land and how did it go? Sure. So on uh, the early morning of um, November 8th, 1942, there were three landing zones in which British and American forces landed. Now, I say British and American because, in fact, there were more Brits than Americans, even though there were... Uh, there were they were just about even Brits and Americans, but they all wore, the, the, the Brits were hidden, is the point I want to make. The Brits played an enormous role, but because, because the French and the Brits had such a horrible experience after the, the fall of France, uh, especially when British troops, um, British bombers destroyed the French fleet in Mersa Kabir, that they had to hide the fact that they were British. Um, so under American command all along, the, uh, the front, it's a 900 mile or so coast, coastline from south of, uh, of uh, Casablanca, starting in Safi, uh, which is where you can find the finest pottery in Morocco, um, all the way up to east of um, Algiers in a place called Sidi Farouche. And the middle center task force was in and around um, Oran. So um, three different landing zones, uh, you'll know, for, you'll, if you remember the, uh, the, the, the movie with Patton, with George Scott. Uh, um, uh, so Patton was in Casablanca, was in the west, and then uh, lesser known generals, actually more failed generals, were in the, uh, the center and the eastern landing zones. Um, uh, uh, there was considerable fighting for three days. Um, um, it didn't last longer than that, for political reasons we'll get into, but uh, there was some considerable fighting um, in uh, certainly in the Western and the Center Task Force. Uh, thank you. Meredith, could you elaborate a little bit on some of those political reasons that uh, change the course of the fighting? How long it lasts, how long it doesn't? So the fighting in Casa and the fighting in Morocco lasts for three days, um, which is, so Casablanca goes for three days, um, Algiers is taken in eight hours, Oran lasts a, bit, a little bit longer than that. 
The fighting in Casablanca, the fighting in Morocco goes on longer because the resident general, Charles Nogues, is determined to hold Morocco. And he puts up a fight. He's offered, um, in the early morning hours of November 8th, a chance to turn Morocco over to the Americans, and he declines. He does not believe that there is an American fleet carrying 33,000 Americans off the coast of Morocco. Um, and so he decides to fight, and the Americans come ashore, and, and um, so, the Americans, so the Americans come ashore. Um, what happens, um, Rob refers to some of the political machinations that go on, that as soon as Algiers is taken, negotiations begin to turn over French North Africa to the Americans and to the, to the Allies to sign an armistice. And this is where we get into negotiations for what's known as the Darlan deal. Turns out that Jean Swan, um, that Admiral Darlan, one of the most hated men in Vichy, France, just happens to be in Algiers at the time of the Allied in, um, assault. And he basically becomes, he becomes at the center of these negotiations. One of the problems that the Allies encounter with the North Africa invasion is that they have been assured by the French resistance that if they show up, the populace will rise up and support the Allies. They will welcome them with open arms, the French army officers will do as well, so will the French Navy, and that does not happen. Instead, they remain loyal to the French leadership, to Pétain, to Darlan, and the Americans and British, British suddenly have a very terrible problem on their hands. Can you explain a little bit about why Darlan was so hated? Um, because he's the head of the fleet, uh, the French Navy. He is um, basically works hand in glove with Pétain, and he is instrumental in orchestrating some of Vichy's uh, more onerous policies. So he becomes sort of public face of collaborationist Vichy. Absolutely, he is on a list. Or the French, uh, the French uh, National Committee in the United States publishes a list in Life magazine. It's a rogues gallery of all the collaborators, and they basically they say they want them all assassinated. And Darlan is at the top of the list. It, exactly. I mean, we, we tend to think of of World War II as a as a focus of unconditional surrender on our enemies. That our enemies, it's black and white. You know, we, we're, we're, we're in this to, to demand that our enemies submit and collapse and, and surrender. But it didn't start that way in North Africa. Uh, actually, this is a gray battle because but while the fighting is still going on, we're actually offering the adversary a, not just a seat at the table, but to stay in control. You don't have to surrender, really. You can still run these territories. Yes, you may have been a collaborator with the Germans. Yes, you may have been you know, um, public enemy number one. But what we need more than anything else is to be able to pass through your territory peacefully. You can do that job better than us in terms of pacifying the territory. So we'll do a deal with you. And that's what the relationship with Darlin was all about, um, a very uh, um, uh, uh, rail politique arrangement um, that in hindsight seems very odd given the black and white unconditional surrender motto that eventually became you know the uh, the flag under which we waged the war I mean at the time it, it they didn't really it didn't appear to them they had any other options because they didn't show, and the Americans and the British were not prepared to occupy North Africa. They did not bring enough troops. They were not prepared to take the French, kick them out, install a complete new government, the way that we would do in Germany, the way that we would do in Italy. We just were not prepared. And so when the French would not leave, the, the, the French officials would not um, sort of sign up with us willingly. We basically said, okay, well, military, uh, necessity requires that we do this deal because we really need to get to Tunisia. Because if we get to Tunisia, then we can help the 8th Army, which is being um, battered by Rommel, and we can find, this is part of, uh, the other reason we were doing Torch is to help, help relieve the British in Libya so that we can um, basically kick the Nazis out of Africa. 
And so it is, it's a real politic deal, it's terrible, and in fact, when it comes through, Churchill is so angry, he wants to fire um, Eisenhower immediately, and they are basically all, wor I mean, Roosevelt sends a telegram, worried that everyone has turned fascist in Algiers and wants to know what has happened. And it is, in a sense, it's a PR disaster uh, for the Americans and for the British. The public backlash is huge, and it takes what is an incredible victory for the Allies. Um, you know, we, take, we do this amazing surprise invasion, it goes really well, and then we make this deal, and it just leaves a really sour taste in everyone's mouth. So if Darlan is uh, public enemy number one in the rogues gallery, who are some of your other favorites, if we can put it that way, colorful characters uh, from this period and from this scene? We can fight over who goes first. Well, we should remember this is uh, Eisenhower's first battlefield command. Um, I mean, we tend to think of, uh, of Ike as, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the brilliant uh, um, uh, orchestra leader of D-Day. Well, this was D-Day before D-Day. And if you read his memoirs, you will find out that, that uh, uh, he was more worried about the, 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 the potential failure of this than he became more worried about the failure of Normandy, that so many things could go wrong, a lot of them did go wrong. I mean, landing zones were missed. The intelligence was all messed up. Um, uh, we relied on the wrong people. Uh, he spent the entire night of the, of the invasion arguing with a French general that we had thought we were going to put in, a guy named Henri Giraud, that we thought we were going to put in as our guy in Algiers. He spent the whole night arguing with him because um, Giraud wanted to be the supreme commander of the entire invasion. And Eisenhower, of course, said, you know, you're crazy. And Giraud said, okay, I refuse to go. And so um, uh, uh, Eisenhower thought the whole thing was lost. And then the next day, when they wake up, they realize that Giraud is irrelevant because Darlan was there. Our intelligence was wrong. Our planning was messed up. Um, uh, and, this, and through this, Eisenhower learned of all the potential uh, mistakes and miscues that can happen in this, in this uh, you know, massive undertaking. And that's just Eisenhower. There are a lot of other fascinating characters that, uh, that emerge, that play huge roles later in, this, in, in the war and later in American foreign policy that, that, that um, first um, you know, broke their teeth in, uh, in Torch in North Africa. What about you, Meredith? You've also got Mark Clark as part of this. Um, Mark Clark is in the bunker with Eisenhower and Giraud trying to negotiate this uh, agreement. It doesn't go well. Mark Clark is actually translating at times. He speaks halfway decent French. Um, he's the one who ends up in Algiers and negotiating with Darlan. And Darlan is so mad at him because Mark Clark, he says, why does Mark Clark keep treating me like a lieutenant? Um, and, beca and because when the French generals start arguing, he just bangs on the table and tells him to get back to task because he doesn't care what their internal politics are, he wants a deal. Um, Mark Clark also has a very large ego. He's a bit of a press hound. Um, and so that sort of plays into this as well. What about the American consul? So I think you're referring to Robert Murphy. Um, uh, Robert Murphy is an American diplomat, uh, originally from Milwaukee. Who, uh, was, um, who had served in the Foreign Service for years and in Germany and Switzerland and in f France and was there when France fell in 1940. And then when France fell, um, Roosevelt asked him, uh, personally asked him to go across to North Africa and be his personal emissary in North Africa and to run a, a uh, basically a, an espionage uh, loop of, um, uh, of 12, um, uh, American vice consuls, who um, uh, whose basic job was to keep was to was to keep an eye on everything the, the the Axis powers were doing in North Africa, and to plan for a possible American invasion. And it was Murphy's particular job was to figure out who among the French commanders could be turned, who could make sure that they wouldn't shoot back. And so that was his number one task. Um, uh, 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 I think Murphy, Murphy failed in his task, um, and I think Murphy um, also ended up not doing such a great job in dealing with the, the politics after 
um, the, uh, uh, the invasion. Um, but, you know, in, in what I call, and I know this is a bit controversial, it's one of the, the great examples of the Peter Principle in American diplomacy, Murphy goes on to become one of the most hallowed diplomats in the history of the American Foreign Service. Um, there's only six of them that ever got their picture on a postage stamp, and one of them is Robert Murphy. Sort of the opposite of no good deed goes unpunished, right? That's right, so. exactly. Um, let's go back to, we've been leaving it hanging since the beginning, Rob. Let's talk about America's relationship with the resistance in Algeria and a group of also uh, several hundred Jews who, as you said, played a very crucial role. Well, there were resistance movements all along North Africa, um, uh, in, in Morocco, in Oran, in Algiers. Only one actually really, you know, shows up. You know, if Woody Allen, Half a Life is showing up, only one really shows up on the day of the invasion. And that's the group in Algiers. And the group in Algiers has, you know, a handful of high-ranking officials, but on the ground, there were 377 um, Algerians who on the night of um, April 8th, um, uh, uh, November. I'm sorry, on the night of November 8th, 1942, uh, um, took over the entire city of Algiers. They arrested Vichy generals and admirals in their bed. They cut all the communications lines. They took over the post office, the telegraph. They took over the police stations. They took over the city. So that when the Allies were invading, there was this huge distraction that they ran the city. Now, of these 377 young men, um, 315 of them were Jewish. And they were led by um, a 20-year-old Jewish medical student named Jose Abulker um, uh, uh, from a very prestigious um, Algerian Jewish family. Here's his picture. Um, and um, they had no weapons knives, 19th century rifles. The Americans had promised to give them grenades and machine guns and they didn't deliver. But despite that, they succeeded. And, and the end result of all of this is that in Algiers itself, fewer Americans died than in any of the other landing zones, substantially fewer. And despite the fact that Murphy failed, in my view, to convince French commanders not to shoot, they still, the Americans and the Brits, were able to be victorious in Algiers swiftly because of the achievements of these French Jewish partisans. Now, you will not read in almost any history book about the role of the French Jewish partisans in Algiers. You may read one sentence about French partisans, or about irregulars, or about um, uh, local units that, um, 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 that were organized to, um, uh, to undermine Vichy um, uh, control of the city that night. Uh, but for me, one of the key aspects of this is that 80% of them were Jewish. Why did they act? They act because Vichy didn't let them be French. Vichy didn't let them be French because they were Jewish. It's not as though they acted because they were Jewish. They acted because Vichy forced them to act as Jews because Vichy denied them the right to be French when they took away their citizenship because they were Jews. And that, I think, is worthy of remembering. So I have to put in a pitch for resistance in Morocco. There were act <laughs> because there, <clears throat> there was actually a very active resistance network in Morocco. Um, it's fairly uh, sophisticated, um, very well developed in Casablanca. There's also some um, um, some other locations as well. It was run by Dave. Um, the primary person who ran it was Dave King out of uh, Office of Strategic Services, and he had coordinated them. They were called off because uh, General Antoine Bartha um, Bethuart convinced King and that he could deliver no gas. And Bethuar is commander of Casablanca Division. 
he is a war hero. And the idea, his plan was that he would go and see no guests at two o'clock in the morning on November 8th, and he would convince him to, to basically turn over Morocco. And so when that fails, they don't realize that until six o'clock in the morning when Bethuard is arrested. And by then, the Americans are already coming ashore and the invasion is already underway. And so in a sense, if Bethuard hadn't sort of stepped up and finally said after months of basically avoiding the Americans that he would help the Allies, um, we might have had actually more bus ro uh, resistance effort um, in Casablanca and in Morocco helping the Allies. Okay, I'd like to tie this all together a little bit because we have many characters, we have many fronts, we have many uh, sources of intrigue. And actually, if we could see the slide, the one that's a cover of Life magazine, um, I just want to make sure that we get it there. As little as I think the American public knows about Operation Torch today. Uh, this I just love this. The, uh, the small headline says, date in Casablanca. Um, people knew at the time. So back home, what was the reception attitude toward it, and how did the United States government try to spin what happened there? So this is actually um, from Life Magazine, and it says February 1941-43. And it's, a, um, it's one of these great sort of OWI, Life Magazine pictorials, where they, um, uh, Jim and Nikki, who is, Jim is a naval aviator, and Nikki is a French um, Jewish refugee. Who, and they go on a date around Casablanca. And it's sort of a, um, it's sort of an advertisement for the Americans in North Africa. And it's the course happens three months after uh, Operation Torch. Um, what they do, um, this is also by this time, we should actually thought this is a great moment to talk about the film. Um, Warner Brothers during the, had basically finished Casablanca. And it was in the can, and they were basically going to release it in the spring of 1943. And they woke up on November 9th to news that the Americans were invading um, Morocco and that Casablanca was an objective. And they said, oh my gosh, we have a film about Casablanca. <laughs> oh my goodness. So they moved up the release date, and they released it on Thanksgiving. Uh, November 1942, and then and then it went into wide release in um, in starting in uh, June of 1943. Um, but Americans didn't really know that much about North Africa. They didn't know that much about Algeria. And if you look at the newspapers from the time, there are maps. This is where Casablanca is. This is where Algiers is. This is where Iran is. This is what French Morocco is. This is what Algeria is. Um, this is French col um, colonialism. And so that they could educate Americans about where they were, where their um, sons were, where their daughters were also headed towards. Um, and so it was sort of, it was a big education campaign. Did you want to add something, Rob? Um, just to add the, this notion that we talked about earlier about the, the blowback from uh, the, the, the deal that we made with the Vichy authorities. Um, uh, so. I mean, just remember the political context. Uh, um, uh, four days before the invasion of North Africa, um, there's a midterm election here in the United States. Um, Roosevelt's political party, the Democrats, um, um, get drummed. They, they lose uh, across the board in terms of congressional seats. So this is not a good political moment for Roosevelt. So then um, uh, uh, the invasion is supposed to be a big boost. You know, the first real victory um, in the European theater in the war. Um, and then, before you know it, all the headlines in the newspapers that would normally be endorsing and supporting and backing Roosevelt were attacking him because Roosevelt endorsed the idea of doing a deal with the Vichyites. And so all the left-wing newspapers, you know, uh, The Nation, etc., were all condemning Roosevelt. Oh my gosh, how could this possibly be? He just invaded North Africa. We have a big victory. What, did, what, what happened? So the next two or three weeks are all about Roosevelt spinning the arrangement with the fascists. Um, he issues a statement um, in which he calls it a temporary expedient, using the word temporary six times. Um, now, of course, a lot of it didn't end up being so temporary. But the whole point was he was backpedaling as fast as he possibly could 
in order to, to, uh, you know, to, to claim whatever victory there was from this embarrassing politics in which he found himself. I do have a final question for each of you before we close, but I think it would be unfair and uh, frankly frustrating to have a program on this subject without seeing at least a couple of minutes from the film Casablanca. <laughs> so um, let's, let's roll the tape. I suppose you know this isn't going to be very pleasant for either of us, especially for you. I'll have to arrest you, of course. As soon as the plane goes, Louis. What was the meaning of that phone call? Victor Laszlo is on that plane. Why don't you stand here? Why don't you stop him? Ask Monsieur Rick. Get away from that phone. I would advise you not to interfere. I was willing to shoot Captain Rano, and I'm willing to shoot you. Hello. Put that phone down. Get me the radio tower. Put it down. has been shot. Round up the usual suspects. a sentimentalist, but you've become a patriot. I believe it seemed like a good time to start. I think perhaps you're right. Good idea for you to disappear from Casablanca for a while. There's a free French garrison over at Brazzaville. I could be induced to arrange a passage. My letter of transit? I could use a trip. But it doesn't make any difference about our bet. You still owe me 10,000 francs. And that 10,000 francs should pay our expenses. Our expenses? Mm -hmm. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Almost seems a shame to speak after that last best line of a movie, but uh, we've come kind of full circle. Meredith, you said actually your interest in this first began with Casablanca. Now that you've actually addressed it as a serious scholar, tell us, what do you feel rings true? What questions still need to be answered? So one of the reasons that when they asked for a clip of this movie, what I recommended, I, I recommend this scene because I think it encapsulates a lot of what goes on in the movie, which is that it's about choices and it's about what side are you on. And really that's one of the things that the movie gets right in so many ways. Um, what side are you on? Who do you trust? What are your politics? What's important to you? And um, I also like this scene because um, it's Captain Raynaud who makes the choice to uh, join the resistance. And in fact, the head of the Securité in Casablanca was a member of the French resistance who helped the OSS, who helped refugees. And so it's sort of, it was sort of stunning to me to realize that as I was working. I, the screenwriters had no way of knowing that was actually the case. And so it was just stunning to me to realize as I was you know, during the history that this, you know, that this man actually was a member of the French Resistance. Um, also, the the movie sort of is gets a sort of struggles of the refugees quite well. Um, it pre presents sort of a glamorous look at refugees, and Casablanca wasn't so glamorous. Um, life in Casablanca as a refugee wasn't particularly glamorous, but it does get right the obsession over visas and how to get out and how difficult it was to get out and the problem of what happens when your papers aren't in order. All of which are very important and subjects that we wrestle with today. 
and Rob. Uh, you come at this as a scholar of the broader Middle East and talk about realpolitik. What do you see as the reverberations of Operation Torch? Well, look, the, the first thing, since we're in this building, it's important to note, um, when the Americans and the Brits came to North Africa, they also liberated the first concentration camps liberated by the Allies during the war. Um, now many of them didn't recognize it at the time. And how they handled those liberations was pretty ham-handed and insensitive. Um, they essentially made all the mistakes that they were able to later correct before they got to Europe. So um, um, uh, when the, it, it was another three months, for example, after Torch before um, the Allies even sent a full-fledged um, uh, mission to survey the camps, which deep in the Sahara Desert stayed operating as though the Allies never arrived. Um, uh, so it, it took another three or four months after that for them to finally figure it out how to liberate the inmates who are in those camps. So it took far longer after Torch to liberate Jews, Spanish Republicans, and anti-fascists, etc., than it did to plan the entire invasion. So it's important to recognize that Torch, in its own way, is connected to the story of this building and to the, the story that even occurs later on in the war, not just in the military sense, but also in terms of the human sense. You know, how you deal with refugees, how you deal with Jews suffering from persecution. Um, uh, and, you know, I've, I've written elsewhere, I think there were those legacies of the reluctance to address the, um, uh, uh, the questions posed by the Jewish situation um, in North Africa, I think had a, um, a regrettably lingering impact on American Middle East policy. And if you want to you know, connect, the, connect the dots, I think you can see elements of that reluctance to, to deal head on with um, uh, the pain and suffering that the Jews suffered in North Africa is just a, um, um, uh, a prelude to what we see in aspects of American policy in dealing with um, DPs and dealing with um, the creation of Israel in the early years of, um, of, uh, of the, of the post-Israel independence um, situation in the Middle East. So very weighty, weighty impacts indeed. Uh, we'd like to allow some time for questions from you, the audience. Uh, what I do ask is that you approach, we have microphones in either aisle so that not only everyone can hear you, but people watching the live stream can hear. And I also ask that you please um, ask questions rather than make speeches. So thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I, I hadn't heard anything um, in what you said about the role of the King of Morocco. Um, I had heard that he uh, supported the Jews. Can you elaborate on that? Um, so the Sultan of Morocco, um, yes, he supported the, he did support the Jews. He was um, he was receptive to their concerns about and about Vichy's le Vichy legislation, but his hands were tied. Um, there wasn't much he could do to oppose uh, Vichy's plans. And even though he was sympathetic, he was anxious about what was happening to them because as a sultan, he felt that the Jews were his responsibility and he did not like, the, he did not like what was happening to their community, but there was a limited amount that he could do. Right. If, I, if I could just add to this, first of all, I think I wanna um, uh, uh, correct what might be a, um, a misperception from our earlier discussion of who was in the camps. Camps were in Morocco, but Jewish Moroccans were not in the camps. Um, uh, the, the Jews who were in these camps were, were mostly um, European Jews, um, uh, either uh, uh, soldiers in the French army um, who were re rewarded with their loyalty by being sent to the camps by Vichy. Um, they were uh, European Jewish refugees. Um, um, uh, anti-fascists, but they weren't Moroccan Jews. Um, there were a couple, but they weren't there because they were Jewish. They were there because they were socialists or communists or that sort of thing. So it's, um, this is important to note because, um, as Meredith, Meredith just said, the Sultan of Morocco 
um, um, certainly projected his, his um, support for Jews, um, even if he couldn't put a, um, um, a halt to the imposition of Vichy um, uh, uh, persecuted, uh, uh, persecution and Vichy prohibitions on Jews. And so that's why today the Sultan of, of Morocco is remembered by the Jews of Morocco as being you know, the absolute um, savior of the people. It's a bit, that goes a bit far um, uh, uh, in the sense that there was never an attempt to exterminate the people, so they didn't need to be saved. But he was certainly um, 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 a ruler who um, projected uh, protection, projected inclusiveness, and considered the Jews of Morocco, along with his Muslim uh, citizens, Muslim subjects, as all subjects together um, under his patronage. Yes. Thanks very much for your great presentations. I have a uh, question about the British and then about the French. On the British, you know, Churchill had kind of a tendency like going over soft underbelly. He did that in World War I with the campaign of the Dardanelles. To what extent was the British uh, pushing for North Africa operation in an effort to take pressure off Montgomery, who was fighting on the uh, Egyptian front and trying to keep the uh, Germans from overrunning the uh, Suez Canal? And on the French side, uh, Rob, in your excellent article in Tablet Magazine, you talked about some of the attitudes of the um, French officials being rather anti-Semitic. And in May, we were in Lyon. We went to the wonderful Museum of the Resistance and Deportation. And the impression we got was the, the French police officials were even more anti-Semitic than the and harsh than the, than the Nazis. Did you find any difference between the French officials in Algeria who were you know, clones who were living in Algeria and those that may have come from the metropole. Can you discuss the anti-Semitic attitudes a bit among the, the French officials? Uh, sure, maybe you want to take the British. Um, absolutely, part of the North Africa operation was to help the British situation in Libya. Tobruk had fallen in June. The uh, situation was fairly dire and they hoped that basically if they put troops in North Africa, they could come at the Germans from the west. And um, so, so that was absolutely the case. That was part of it, but the overall thing was to open a second front and help Stalin. Uh, in terms of the anti-Semitism of the local Algerian uh, French officials, there's no doubt. Um, I mean, there's two things to remember. One, the, the Algerian French officials did not suffer the German occupation the way the French officials in the, in the metropole suffered it. Um, uh, I mean, things were bad in North Africa um, because of the war, um, food, um, oil, that sort of thing. But there was no German occupation. Um, uh, and then secondly, um, the French, the, the, the Colons, were e extra anti-Semitic. I mean, they had an extra dose of anti-Semitism in them. Um, uh, uh, they hated the idea that in 1870, the French government uh, issued an edict that gave the Jews of Algeria the right to claim French citizenship. Putting a French Algerian Jew born in Algiers on exactly the same legal status as they were. They hated this idea that any native would have this, would have this right. And so Jews were the particular target of the local French officialdom, um, and that came out in, um, uh, in what happened both in, uh, you know, in, fi in Vichy government um, between 40 and 42, and even um, uh, in, the, in the weeks and months after when the Americans were the titular power, but Vichy officials still ran the country. I believe this gentleman was waiting first, and then you, sir, thank you. Um, where was uh, de Gaulle in all this? Uh, he was in London, I believe, and uh, he was a pain in the neck to Churchill, among others. Uh, number, number two, given what you've said about how the local French in Algiers 
uh, felt, or at least French officials, how was the resistance able to move so quickly and so efficiently in taking, in, in taking uh, over? Or do De Gaulle? I'll do De Gaulle. De Gaulle was a pain, yes. That's the and technical th historiographic that, term. That, right? That, that, right, and uh, it, um, there are many swear words in telegrams and letters about him, particularly by Churchill. Um, he is at this point in, um, he's in Carrollton Gar Gardens in um, London. They don't tell him about Torch until it starts. Really? Be really. Because, there w because, um, the <laughs> because his headquarters in London was notorious for leaking, and they worry that if he knew about it, so would the Germans very quickly. So he doesn't know about it, and he is really irritated. That's the other historiographical term for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's very irritated, he's very upset, um, and he uh, spends the next few months moping, and Churchill has to beg him to come to the Casablanca conference to talk with Giraud about the future of the French resistance. And that's one of the interesting things about the French resistance in um, North Africa, which we haven't talked about, which is that you could be a member of the French resistance in North Africa and not be a Gaullist. Um, and that's because one of the myths that develop after the war is that everyone is in the French resistance, everyone's in the resistance, and everyone supports de Gaulle. But North Africa does not support de Gaulle. They're, um, in general, they sort of, they're not a particular fan of his because of the debacle at Dakar, um, in which he tries to take Dakar, it goes badly, and he slinks off again, and they don't see him as a strong figure. Um, so de Gaulle, in this, he's sort of at this point, he's in betwixt, betwixt and between looking for his opening, which eventually does come in 1943. Right, because de Gaulle does get the last laugh. He does. He plays the long game, and he, and he outmaneuvers everybody. Um, remind me, just one word. Um, Algiers, how, how did they... Oh, how did they do it? Opposition? How did they do it? Well, um, it, it's, it's a fascinating story of how they trained, how they prepared, how they gathered the the knives, the old, the old rifles. Um, the, the lion's share of the resistance group in Algiers um, um, trained in a, um, we would call it today a health club, um, uh, you know, like uh, sport and health. Um, it, was a, it was a boxing club. Um, uh, uh, they trained, they kept their, their meager weapons right underneath the boxing ring. Um, underneath a portrait of Pétain um, that was looking down at them. Um, uh, it's called the Géo Gras, named after a French boxing champion. Um, uh, they were able to do it because they were, they were clever. They were sneaky. They, no one expected them. And in the middle of the night, I mean, nobody expected this invasion. This is, this is when we think about it, 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 it's almost, I mean, it's almost crazy. This was hundreds of boats sailing thousands of miles, um, uh, and they ended up off the shore of, of, of Algeria, Morocco, and nobody expected this invasion to happen. And so all the, all the French generals and admirals were in bed. And they just, not, they literally walked up to the front door and arrested them in their pajamas. It's a movie waiting to happen. Yes. There is a movie. It's called A Night of Fools. There's a, a recent movie that came out um, uh, uh, Night of Fools, it's called a French movie. Um, it was shown here at the Smithsonian, um, but it's a, it, it, it tells the story pretty well. Yes, sir. Um, one thing that I'm wondering is, what was the attitude of the free French towards the Jews? In North Africa or in occupied France or where? Um, I'm specifically focusing on North Africa here. Look, the, the general story is that the Free French embraced um, the Jews, um, that, and that uh, overwhelmingly the Jews of North Africa were supportive of the Free French. Um, uh, Abu Kerr and all of his people, they were Gaullists. They were a minority, but they were, they were Gaullists. And it was, it was when de Gaulle arrived and, t and he took over in November 43, that is wh exactly when the Jews had their rights restored. It wasn't until de Gaulle arrived that they got their citizenship back. Okay, and then final question. 
I'm always surprised by the complete absence of local Arabs from narratives in Casablanca and in today's story. Uh, and we know that French was particularly br brutal to Arabs in the 50s and 60s. What was the relationship of local Arabs with Vichy French? And how did they perceive American invasion? I think this is a big question. That's the silence I'm seeing is how to approach it. An important question. Um, under Vichy, sort of life went, under Vichy France in Morocco, life went on. Um, but the Arabs were treated, like I said, there was a hierarchy where the Europeans at the top and the Arabs are second and the Jews are third, and which meant the Europeans, just one example, Europeans get the high amount of rations, Arabs get another middling amount, and the Jews get, get even less. Um, so that's one example of um, that. Um, in terms of um, Vichy, um, there were some Arabs who were members, of, I'm sorry, some Moroccans who were members of the resistance, but primarily it was um, staffed by French just because of it's the nature of um, who are people who are in power and have power and therefore have access to plans and information, weapons, contacts, um, things like that. Rajiv. Yeah, um, uh, I, I think Meredith is, is exactly right. Uh, you know, the the vast majority of Arabs um, uh, were observers and bystanders to the experience of uh, Vichy control and uh, Vichy imposition of of anti-Semitic laws against Jews. Um, at the same time, there was a um, a regrettably um, uh, large minority who helped make it possible. It, it, Vichy wouldn't have been able to, to operate its control if there weren't some willing partners among the local population. Um, uh, 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 they weren't responsible for the decisions, but they, you know, there's a certain percentage that, that were full partners in this. And then there was a smaller percentage, still very important, actually, I think extremely important, who opposed what Vichy did, and so um, uh, uh, you know, I like to tell the story about um, uh, the head of the Algerian um, uh, opposition party, um, um, uh, named man by the name of Masali Haj, who um, uh, uh, his his most famous saying about this is um, uh, taking away the rights of the Jews does nothing to enhance the rights of the Muslims. And so we get no, we, we, we get no benefit. We have no um, pleasure at seeing the Jews of Algeria suffer. If anybody thought that this was going to be a way to ingratiate themselves with the local Arabs, the local Muslims, they were wrong. And that's in fact the case. I mean, there's, uh, there's quite a remarkable story in, uh, in Algiers itself where the religious authorities of Algiers, the Muslim, chief Muslim authorities, prohibit any Muslim from accepting Vichy's offer to be a custodian of Jewish property. Vichy um, you know, took over a lot of Jewish property and they offered them to, to mostly French but to some Arabs. And the religious authorities prohibited it. But the most important part of that story is not that the religious authorities prohibited it, it's that every Muslim in Algiers obeyed them. I, mean, I don't know about you, but, but not, I think it's fair to say that not everybody listens to everything they hear when they go to, to, to church, synagogue, or mosque. But in this case, not a single Muslim became a custodian of Jewish property in Algiers, which is pretty significant. This is also a period in which, um, under Vichy, that Moroccan nationalism begins to reawaken. And they're inspired by the Atlantic Charter, um, they're also, you know, Vichy does bring with it a certain discontent and there are sort of rumblings again and it begins to coalesce and it, the, um, the Allied invasion pr presents them with an opportunity and in January 1944, the, the independence movement springs forth once again after having been shut down brutally in 1937. And so there are other things afoot 
during um, during the war that the war sort of helps foster. So many complicated currents. It's a very complicated time. <laughs>